Good evening, everyone. I believe we're live. Okay. Hi. Good evening, everyone. I'm Pastor Tim Westermeyer, the senior pastor of St. Philip the Deacon in the western suburbs of Minneapolis. Uh, and on behalf of this congregation, it is my privilege and pleasure to welcome you to the third event in our 2021-2022 Faith and Life Lecture Series. Um, I'm going to start actually by saying just a word about format. Tonight is actually something a, a little new for us. Uh, for a long time, of course, during COVID, we did these events entirely virtually. Uh, tonight, we're actually doing a bit of a hybrid thing. So uh, welcome to all of you who are joining us virtually. Uh, we also have a number of people sitting in person in our sanctuary who are watching the event on a big screen in our sanctuary for our virtual speaker. So um, I'm praying that uh, all of this hangs together and the technology works, and I'm grateful to our tech team for making it possible. Uh, I will tell you, too, that we will hear from our speaker for about 25 or 30 minutes uh, for uh, prepared remarks, and then we'll have plenty of time, hopefully, for questions and answers. So I've already spoken to the people who are here in person. If you have questions, uh, it's probably simplest to send them up with a sheet of paper. Those of you who are joining us virtually uh, can submit questions, which hopefully we'll have time to answer or ask uh, at faithandlife.org slash livestream, where there's a form to submit questions, or you can send questions to social at spdlc.org, uh, which is an email address, obviously, social at spdlc.org. I do want to welcome all of you who are joining us, especially those of you joining us for the first time. Um, I don't think I mentioned this, but this is the 19th season of the Faith and Life events, so we've been doing this for a long time. Uh, and uh, the point of these events is to bring in um, well-known speakers from around the country and even from around the world who are Christian and who are willing to say a word about their faith and how it is lived out in their everyday life. I will tell you that the vast majority of our speakers actually are lay people, so they're journalists or bloggers or executives or um, other types of people who live out their faith in the everyday world of work. Um, and so tonight's speaker is a little bit of an outlier in that he, in fact, is um, someone who is a professional person of faith, I guess you could call him a bishop. And so let me just say a word about him. We are, we're absolutely delighted that he's able to be with us tonight. Um, he was born in Chicago. I will tell you he was raised in Buffalo, New York, which I mentioned because I imagine that he is still smarting from a couple of weeks ago over the coin toss, and uh, maybe we'll get into um, overtime rules in the NFL tonight. I'm not sure. Um, he went to Yale Divinity School. He has become, in the meantime, a well-known author and speaker. You may have seen him uh, preside at a number of very high-profile events, including the funeral of George H.W. Bush and Colin Powell, and he also uh, presided at the wedding of Prince Harry and Meghan Markle a few years ago. He is the first African-American to be elected the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, and we are thrilled to have him join us tonight. Will you join me in welcoming presiding bishop, the Most Reverend Michael Curry? Thank you. Thank you, and... and um, just to make sure uh, we're synced, can you hear me okay? All right. <laughs> Thumbs up all the way around. I, I think we're good. I think we're good. Yep. Well, thank you, my brother. I really do appreciate, um, especially the invitation to be able to share time with you and the good folk um, there. And I thought I would actually be physically with you. <clears throat> until the Omicron variant had other ideas and um, we had to, we changed all of my plans for a little bit. Um, this is the way of life in, in COVID and we all just kind of adjust to it, but I very much look forward to being with you um, um, uh, next year. I think it is, if, if that's correct. I really do look forward to being with you. And um, uh, I mean, this time of year to be sure um, is always interesting um, in your part of the country. I live in the South right now, uh, but but be that as it may, I grew up in Buffalo and can handle it. So <laughs> it's it's really a blessing and a, and a privilege to be able to share um, in, in this series, which um, I think is of critical import in any time, um, faith in life, 
Uh, faith apart from life is a nice uh, conversation, but it doesn't have any consequence. Faith in life can make a profound difference in life and actually can be a source of life. Um, and so this series and its contribution to the ongoing conversation among us as people of faith, as followers of Jesus, I think can make a profound difference for us in any time, but particularly in times like these. So thank you. Let me, let me um, share some reflections that arise out of a, a, a little known quote from Dr. King that I've been living with for a while, and I don't know why it's never quite gotten, well, it's not as much of a soundbite as some of the other quotes. That's the reason. I know the reason. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it, was, it was first said by him in a sermon preached uh, called Loving Your Enemies, um, and he preached it in 1956 or 57, soon after the Mon Montgomery bus boycott, as his thoughts and understandings of, of love were evolving um, and still in a very formative stage, but were beginning to develop. And, and he later reiterated it over time in a number of different contexts. And he said it this way, we must discover the power of love, the redemptive power of love. And when we discover that, we will be able to make of this old world a new world. Love is the only way. Jesus discovered that. Love is the only way. Jesus discovered that and told us. I am uh, I'm convinced that he was right. So long as we don't sentimentalize love. Uh, so long as we don't pigeonhole it into corners of sentimental attachment and understanding. So long as we don't limit it to only our personal and interpersonal relationships, but seek to translate it into both our social, economic, and political relationships, so long as we don't ghettoize it, so long as we universalize it as at the core of life itself, then we will begin to discover the redemptive power of love to lift up and to liberate, to help and to heal when nothing else can and sometimes when nothing else will. Now, in the last month or so, I've been playing with an idea about this that, that I want to share with you. And it, and it grows out of our particular moment, I think, in this country, in our sojourn. We're just coming out of the month of January. That, that grows out of having lived through a pandemic and to some extent still living in it. That grows out of all the ambiguity and struggles that are attendant to that, some of which we don't even know yet because we're in the middle of it. Having lived through at least a moment of a racial reckoning with our racial past here as a nation, not only in terms of ethnicity, black and white and chattel slavery and police violence and unremitting poverty, but in terms of indigenous boarding schools, the buried bodies of children here in the United States, we thought that was just in Canada, our neighbors above the border. But having found interred bodies of children and, and the United States military helping to return those children to their ancestral lands, that was here just last year during this pandemic. 
and then those who are Asian American. Suddenly, I think many of us became much more aware of the anxiety and fear with which many of our Asian American and Pacific Island brothers, sisters, and siblings live. And then on, on top of that, I mean, I, I don't mean to depress you, but this is, this is just, this is where we are. Um, uh, we, we, we thought January the 6th was a day, but it wasn't a day. It may have been a dangerous way. That is not over yet. And then I could, I could go on. The nations met for climate change and sort of attended but did not solve. And there's work to do, not for Michael Curry, I'm an old man, but for generations who come after all of us. Will they have air to breathe, water to drink, a planet that is habitable for them all? And we have not resolved that question. And I, I could go on. Synagogues, people at worship, at prayer, held hostage in Texas. And now the, the, the levels of anti-Semitic threats against our Jewish siblings rising significantly as are threats against our Muslim siblings and Sikh siblings. I mean, something's wrong. Something is off kilter. And again, I don't mean to depress you. I'm just painting the picture the landscape, and I could go on and on, even as I speak this evening on the news, threatened bombings at historically black colleges and uni universities on the East Coast of the United States in the last day or two. What that's all about, we don't know. The reality is America needs a revival. Stay with me. I know I'm an Episcopalian and you don't hear Episcopalians talking about revival. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> you don't hear Episcopalians talking about revival. But we need a revival that is more than resuscitation of a corpse. We, we, we need a revival that is not about um, an emotional experience. That's not what I'm talking about. We, we need a revival in the classic sense of that term. And so I did a little quick research um, on the very word, the English word, and the etymology uh, from the French to the Latin for the word revival and discovered something very interesting. I, I discovered that, that the Latin root of, of the word to revive um, actually means to bring to life again, to restore something to life, not resuscitating a corpse, but actually to restore it to the vibrancy of, of life, to take that which is broken and tattered and torn apart and heal it and mend it and bind it back together, to take that which is dead and raise it to life. We need a revival. We need a revival in this country. We must discover the power of love, the redemptive power of love. And when we discover that, listen to King's language, we will take of this old world and make a new world. Love is the way. Jesus discovered that. St. Paul captured that. In 2 Corinthians, when he, when he says at one point in chapter 4 and into chapter 5, he says the, the love of Christ urges us on. And he said, for if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who in Christ was reconciling the world to himself and who has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Oh, we, we need a revival. Somebody, I mean, I, I, I don't think I'm out an Episcopalian out to lunch. We need a revival in this, our beloved country and in this world in which we live. 
We need a revival of elemental human relationships. The reality is we don't know each other very well. Across races, across religious traditions, across um, um, ethnic varieties, across social economic differences, we, we don't know each other very well in America. We, we really don't. Um, and, in, and in fact, a few years ago, uh, a guy named a Bishop gave, uh, he wasn't a Bishop, uh, it's his last name, but um, I did a demographic study, this was over 20 years ago, that's been more used for businesses and politicians than by, by church folk. But he did this uh, basic a demographic study where he identified what others had identified, that basically America has resegregated itself successfully without it, without Jim Crow laws. And it's done so not primarily or exclusively along lines of racial segregation. It's, it's done so um, uh, to some extent around socioeconomic, to some extent. But he says, more significantly, America has resegregated itself around like-mindedness. And he said, you, the, he said the, the demographers who work with marketing studies, the demar demographers who work with politicians, um, they already know this, um, that, that people tend to cluster in areas with people who think like they do. And you can actually do it by zip code. And every time we have an election, you know, you get the red areas and the purple areas and the blue areas. You know, it, it, we actually have seen some of this. And it's true. It is as if somebody went and dug up Jim Crow and said, we have figured out a way to take America down. We will help America resegregate itself into like mindedness. So folk who agree with each other will be over here and folk who agree with each other over there and never the twain shall meet and that will tear this nation asunder. My friends, we cannot go on that way. We must find ways to cross the divides, not for political expediency, but for human relationship. And we who are in the churches as well as our neighbors in synagogues and temples and mosques, we may well be poised to be bridge people to cultivate these relationships across differences. We must do this for the sake of the nation we all love. And frankly, for the sake of the world that God so loved that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus. Dr. King once said, we will either learn to live together as brothers and sisters or perish together as fools. The choice is ours, chaos or community. Oh, we, we need a revival of relationships between us. Oh, as children of God, um, Democratic children of God and Republican children of God. You, you see what I'm saying? Uh, Christian children of God and Muslim children of God. We need um, a, 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 a theist children of God and atheist children of God. I know my atheist. Actually, I've got an atheist friend who doesn't mind me calling her child of God. She says, I don't believe that, but if it makes you feel better, it's okay with me. I said, well, that's all right. It makes me feel better. <laughs> and but, but we need that revival of relationships among us, sometimes small, sometimes large, but we need it. We need it in our government. We cannot, segregation was evil as Jim Crow and Bull Connor's Birmingham. And it is evil now. It separates, it fragments, it distorts, it violates human relationships. And it can destroy the social contract the foundations of a democratic society itself. So I wanna invite you and your church communities to figure out how can we bridge relationships. And it doesn't have to be big ways, in small ways. We need a revival. But we need a revival of something else. I'm beginning to see, I don't know why this is dawning on me in the last few years. I'm, be, 
beginning to see that we need a revival of the ideals, of the lofty and noble ideals that we already share for the most part. Um, I, some years ago, some of y'all may remember the, um, the book by uh, Robert Fulgram, All I Needed to Know I, I Learned in Kindergarten. Remember that? It was in early 1990s, I think. And I mean, I love the book. I have it somewhere. But I, I found it in my notes um, with the, the section where he has the list of things that you learned in kindergarten. And, you know, when you think I have, I have vague memories of somehow kind of learning these things in kindergarten, first grade, somewhere thereabouts. Anyway, in his list, he has nine things. He lists, he says, first, share everything. Oh, I want you to imagine the House of Representatives and the Senate of the United States. Y'all hear me now? Share everything. Imagine the United Nations. <laughs> Share everything. Second one, play fair. Now, I won't say anything about the um, coin toss and the Buffalo Bills. Uh, <laughs> we lost fair and square, but it's a coin toss. It's like, oh, God, is there no justice? But, but anyway, but play fair. You know, there's just some basic decency. You know, C.S. Lewis told us that more theologically. There's a basic, human beings know basic fairness. Um, even in dictatorial, autocratic societies, when they're lying, they pretend that it's the truth because nobody's going to believe an out and out lie. You got to make it look like the truth. That's because human beings are constituted around truth. And we, if you're going to lie, make it sound like it's true. <laughs> Number three, don't hit people. This is not rocket science, but it, it, it's elemental human society. Number four, clean up your own mess. Number five, don't take things that aren't yours. I, I'm going to leave Mr. Putin and Ukraine out at the moment, but let's just apply personal these principles to global context. Don't take things that aren't yours. I'm just leaving that there. Number six, say you're sorry when you hurt somebody. Number seven, wash your hands before you eat. Number eight, flush. Lord, yes, flush. <laughs> and number nine, when you go out into the world, watch out for the traffic, hold hands, and stick together. The old slaves used to say, walk together, children, and don't you get weary, because there's a great camp meeting in the promised land. We have some elemental values that, that may not appear to be lofty ideals, but they point in that direction when you extrapolate them, <coughs> that we already share. I mean, there is no, you cannot constitute a society that doesn't do these basic kinds of things. And, and yet this American democracy experiment in representational democracy is predicated upon those kinds of principles and some loftier ideals that we do share. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. My friends, we have some shared values. Four score and seven years ago, our forefathers brought upon this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men, that all people, that all human beings are created equal. And if that's not enough, I would suggest that most of us, when we were children in elementary school, stood up in the morning and face the flag, put a hand over our heart, and said, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. Listen to this. One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. That's America. That's America. That's 
That's who we are. There are the ideals we already share. Reclaim those. Revive those. Live all of our differences with those as our highest and noblest aspirations. And we will rise above our differences. And America will truly be a shining city on a hill. We already have some shared ideals. And we need a revival of them. And lastly, and, and I say this as, as one who is a follower of Jesus of Nazareth. And I know that people of faith must come to this conclusion in their ways that are authentic to them. I come to it as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus. And I know and believe that Jesus was so clear. He was just so clear. The New Testament and the Gospels are just so clear that at the center of the life and teachings of Jesus of Nazareth is this passionate commitment to the love of God as the way of life. In John's gospel at the Last Supper, a new commandment I give you. A new, you hear that language? A new commandment I give you that you love one another just as I have loved you. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now abide in my love. That's Jesus talking. God so loved the world in John 3.16. Notice that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that he came among us and that he gave up his life on the cross. That's what love looks like. This is not sentimental stuff we're talking about. This is not sweet by and by stuff we're talking about. This is hard headed sacrifice that is willing to do what is necessary for the good and the well-being of others as well as the self. And that kind of love is a game changer. His lawyer came up to Jesus one day. Later, a number of lawyers came up to him several days. But in this one particular, Jesus is, it actually was during Holy Week. And the lawyer comes up to him and he says, great teacher, what is the greatest teaching in the entire legal edifice of Moses? And Jesus says, well, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the first and the great commandment. The second is like unto it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. I don't know that we realize how stunning that is. On this love of God and love of neighbor hangs and depends everything God was trying to teach us through Moses. Everything God was trying to teach us through Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Obadiah, everything that God was trying to teach us through the law and the prophets and better extrapolating from not just the Hebrew scriptures, but everything God has been trying to tell us and teach us through the Bible, through our Christian tradition, love of God, love of neighbor. This is the way to life. This is the way to revival. Because if it's not about love, it's not about God. I don't care how holy and sanctimonious and how many passages of the Bible get quoted. If it's not about love, it is not about God. And if you don't believe me, maybe you'll believe 1 John chapter 4. Verse seven, beloved, let us love one another because love is of God and those who love are born of God and know God. Those who do not love do not know God. Why? Because God is love. If it's not about love, it's not about God or as Duke Ellington would, would have said it, it don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. No. Love of God, love of neighbor, love of the other. This is the key to life. This is the key to revival. 
And this is a key to America finding its soul again. Well, let me bring this to a conclusion. I'm, I got my eye on the clock. Um, oh, when I was a parish pastor, I know there are parishioners who would love to have had me keep my eye on that clock. I, I used to tell them all the time, I got my eye on the prize and it's not the clock. But nonetheless, <laughs> I was in the fifth grade in Miss Lenny's fifth grade class. This was, would have been 1963. And, and the reason I remember it, it was that was the year President Kennedy was assassinated. We were actually sitting in Miss Lenny's class listening to a, a public radio. Um, and the program was interrupted uh, because the president had been shot in, in Dallas. And um, in fifth grade, I, I, I remember learning fractions and the kind, that kind of thing. I also remember that it was in fifth grade that um, there had been some kind of desegregation plan in Buffalo. And so black kids who lived in East Buffalo, in a particular section of East Buffalo, we were reassigned to a school in West Buffalo. I mean, you could walk it, but in West Buffalo. And so it was our first year um, um, at a new school. So I, it, it's, it is vivid in my memory. And Miss Lenny happened to just be an extraordinary teacher. She was from Scotland and she used to tell stories of her homeland in Scotland. Just fascinating person. Well, anyway, it was in fifth grade in social studies and Miss Lenny was teaching us about the great seal of the United States. And she taught us, you know, the great seal, it's the one with the eagle. And I remember her telling us they, originally there was a debate as to whether or not the national bird should be a, a, an eagle or a turkey. I remember even as a kid thinking, a turkey? Why wouldn't God's name? Uh, apparently Ben Franklin wanted the turkey, and I don't know why, but anyway, he wanted the turkey. I'm glad he lost that debate. Um, but I mean, can you imagine us being the national turkeys? I mean, that, that is like, good Lord. <laughs> But anyway, so, uh, you know, it's the one with the eagle and, and you see it on it's on the presidential flags and congressional flags and those kinds of things. And the turkey or the eagle has um, in one set of Italians has um, uh, arrows and in the other olive branches. Strength and peacemaking. All together. And, and above the, the eagle, sometimes it's in a, written in a banner the Latin words, e pluribus unum. And I remember Miss Lenny explained to us that it's a Latin phrase, e pluribus unum, that is the official motto of the United States. She had to tell us what a motto was. We, you know, we didn't know, we're in the fifth grade, what's a motto? And she explained, a motto is, is something that reflects the highest aspirations of a nation, of a people. It's who we seek to be in all that we do. And she said, this is our national motto, e pluribus unum, from many, one. From many diverse people, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. It was years later though, that I discovered that the phrase e pluribus unum came from the writings of Cicero, of the Roman Republic, and likely came from this sentence of Cicero, in which Cicero said, and I quote, when each person loves the other as much as he loves himself, it makes one out of many possible. Cicero was right. But Cicero was right as far as I'm concerned because Jesus was right. And Jesus was right because Moses was right. And Moses was right because God, who the Bible says is love, has been right from the very beginning. That the way of love is the way to life for a nation and for a world. We must discover the power of love, the redemptive power of love. And when we discover that, we will make of this old world a new world. For love is the only way Jesus discovered that. 
may we discover it too. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop. And uh, if you were here in person, you would be hearing wild applause. Uh, I, I have to apologize to you, Bishop. Thank you again for your thoughts and, and your wonderful words. I was chatting with your assistant um, in preparation for today, and she said, you know, he's, as every speaker, uh, and I know this because for a whole year I preached to an empty sanctuary, every speaker, oh, yeah. of course, draws energy from the people in the pews in this case. So yes. the poor Bishop Curry here is on a Zoom call and having to look at me as the only audience. And uh, anyway. <laughs> well, you're uh, a wonderful audience. Mark. Well, <laughs> I don't know about that. Uh, but on behalf of everyone who's been able to hear you from far away or in the pews here, thank you, thank you, thank you. We're going to let the bishop rest his voice for just a minute. Uh, I've got a few announcements, a few thank yous. Um, starting with the next event uh, in the Faith and Life series, which will be on Thursday, March 17th, featuring Sorab Amari, who, whose family were Iranian immigrants. Um, so again, Thursday, March 17th, I just was in touch with him uh, in the last day or two, and the plan at this point is that he will be here in person here at St. Philip the Deacon. So uh, please join us for that. Um, as always, I will remind you, you can get updates about upcoming events uh, if, by signing up for our emails at the Faith and Life website. Uh, you can also follow us on social media. Uh, Bishop Curry uh, hinted at this, and I'm going to now formally announce it. Uh, we are delighted to be able to announce that he, Bishop Curry, will be joining us again, God help us, in person this time, um, for the conclusion of next year's season. So that's the 2022-2023 Faith and Life series. And that will be, you can mark your calendars right now, Tuesday, May 9th of 2023. Tuesday, May 9th of 2023. I will say, by the way, these are almost always on Thursday nights. Um, and, uh, you know, the bishop's a very busy man. We uh, had this one on a Tuesday night, at a, and I, I'm considering that to be very providential now because does anyone remember what happens this Thursday? start of the Olympics. So oh. as impressive as you are, Bishop Curry, yeah, I, I'm yeah. glad we're not going up against the uh, opening ceremonies of the Olympics. <laughs> so anyway, that's a couple of upcoming things. And then I want to say a word, a few words of thanks. Um, those of you who are here in the pews have, have handouts. Uh, and those of you at home, I hope we have a slide that shows our major sponsors, uh, which include Crossroads Financial Group, The Valuation Group, Ulrich Real Estate, Mally Design, Rapid Packaging, Cressa, Augio, Productivity Inc., and Mastercraft Labels. They, along with countless individuals, make these events possible from the beginning. Uh, they have operated uh, in the black and not as part of the budget item of the church, but rather through the generous support of those organizations and individuals. So uh, to all of you who support this series so generously, I say thank you, thank you, thank you. And again, if you were here, uh, you would hear wild applause, but it's hard to hear that over Zoom, so trust me. Um, I also do want to say a couple of words of thanks uh, to people who the bishop knows. I, I mentioned his assistant, uh, Sharon Jones. Uh, she has been absolutely wonderful in helping to plan this, so I, I thank Sharon, and, and Bishop, please thank her for her wonderful work in getting this organized. I also want to thank uh, someone else who I think the bishop knows, a gentleman named Scott Gunn, who yes. is the head of a part of the Episcopal Church called Move Forward, <coughs> or Forward Movement, isn't it? Forward Is it Movement, yeah. Forward Movement. Yeah. And uh, Scott's uh, <clears throat> also, also an Episcopal priest. I will tell all of you, I would, I'll plug something that he does, which is called Lent Madness. Yes. Um, <laughs> if you've heard of March Madness with NCAA College, uh, Lent Madness is uh, a competition during Lent to let people vote for uh, the saint that they think is most um, impressive. So it's a lot of fun and I encourage you to check it out. I will also mention um, this book. This is one of the Bishop's many books, Love is the Way. Uh, and we partner with an independent bookseller in St. Paul, Subtext Booksellers. Uh, if you go to their website, subtextbooks.com, you can purchase this and they will give you free shipping if you include faith and life in the promo code. And then I also want to mention our uh, quarterly magazine, Inspire, which uh, Bishop was kind enough to sit down with me over Zoom to do an interview. I don't think we have any 
hard copies of this anymore, but you can find it at our, uh, electronically at spdlc.org slash inspire. And if you're interested in receiving uh, future issues of the magazine, please uh, let us know at, uh, let's see, social at spdlc.org or um, what's the other one that they could send it to, Kate, that I'm forgetting right now. That'll work, okay, social at spdlc.org. Um, and then I want to thank Darren and Paul and Kate for their work and helping to make this technology work tonight. Uh, and thank all of you for being here. So uh, with that, I'm going to now turn it over to some opportunity for some questions. Um, and Bishop, I'm actually going to start, if you don't mind, with one that came to mind myself while you were speaking. Part of your message, of course, is about um, our capacity to get to know one another. <laughs> And maybe if you could just, it's not a question as much as a, I'd invite your comment. It strikes me um, that that capacity as Christians goes way back in our tradition. And I think here of two individuals who, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Dr. King quotes in his letter from the Birmingham jail, uh, Augustine and Aquinas. Um, and this isn't what he's quoting, but Augustine, one of his famous quotes is, here, the other side. And Aquinas lived at a time when there were these major debates in universities. And one of the ground rules for those debates, if you and I were going to debate an issue, for example, publicly, the first thing that had to happen is I had to state your position right. to your satisfaction. And then you would have to state my position to my satisfaction. And having done that, then we could talk about how we disagreed or the merits of the case. Right. And I guess I just mentioned that because I wonder if as Christians we have forgotten that deep in our roots is this capacity to to do precisely that, to hear the other side, to recognize the, uh, the what is right in another position. And I don't, I'm not sure if you want to say a little bit about that or not, but or if you could respond to that. Well, you know, it's funny you would say, it's amazing you, you'd say that because... <clears throat> We, we it's in our pastoral traditions. For example, um, I mean, I'm not a parish pastor anymore, so I don't spend time with with couples struggling in a marriage, and um, at least in the preliminary conversations with them, and then get them to a marriage counselor or a therapist as need be. But one of the things that's often helpful, at least in the early stages, and that is a part of any kind of real marriage counseling, is the exercise precisely in what Aquinas said you must do in a debate. That, okay, she has said something. Now you tell her what, you, what did you what did you hear? What did she just say? Not how did you interpret it? Not how did you, what did she just say? Let's, and, and what that does is it takes a while and it's almost a spiritual practice. It's a spiritual practice of listening to be able to enter the other's space on their terms and hear them. Um, I was uh, in Utah, uh, uh, well, it's been a number of years now, and I actually recount this story in the book, <clears throat> and I was there for a diocesan convention, um, and the bishop asked, suggested that I meet a priest um, who's now retired, but who had, after um, the, the presidential election in 2018, I believe it was, or 15, I, I've 18, um, was... Um, had been in his community a number of years, and he was both a priest and therapist, but had been rooted in that community for years, brought together people across differences who clearly were, you know, red and blue. I mean, just clearly different. But he had been around, people trusted him, and he didn't bring them together for debate. He brought them together um, to actually listen to each other around issues that divided them, but to listen to their personal stories that helped them get to that, whatever the conclusion was that they had. And then to be able to share that personal story back, which is very similar. The genius of that is it moves, it doesn't change people's, our minds about a particular question or issue, but the, it helps to nurture a relationship that can change our relationship with each other. And when that is shifted, then our capacity to embrace difference and actually maybe even learn from each other or agree to disagree becomes greater. That takes hard work. That is the spiritual discipline of listening. Um, it is the deep spiritual li discipline of listening 
that you actually see in Jesus in the New Testament. I don't want to wax off on that. But if you let, watch Jesus carefully, I mean, you know, kind of watch carefully how he listens to folk. It, it's, it's not that he's reading them in some magical way. He's listening to them. He's listening to their hearts. <laughs> and um, our capacity to do that with each other is what happens when we live together. Well, what can happen when we live together. Um, I mean, families are notorious, but with the, families invent, invented dysfunction. So I don't want to like, uh, you know, turn families into utopia. But when we live together enough to actually know each other, the potential capacity to do that is greater. It's lesser now because we don't have those kind of sustained relationships. We, we don't have that as much where I get to know you because I know you. We, we've been together, you know what I mean? And so I almost um, hear you even when you don't speak. And, and But that's the key to human relationship, which is the key. Democracy is dependent on the human capacity to be in relationship across differences. And when that doesn't happen, uh, democracy will falter. And, and so what Aquinas was talking about was not about debate. He was talking about relationship and how to engage in all of the differences that are part of life. <laughs> Boy, that, thank you for that. Well, and thank you. Wow. Um, so a couple things. Again, I've got plenty of questions. Keep us oh, going for a little bit here. But uh, thank you for your message of hope. Someone writes and then says, all of what you say makes total sense. How do we start accomplishing this on a practical level? And again, maybe that's part of what you just started with. But I don't know if you want to say more about that. So the practical level of loving one another. Yeah, I think, I mean, that's, I mean, this is to actually... Um, Figure out how can I become a um, an instrument of relationships across difference, and it may be as simply as doing it one on one with somebody and to be intentional, not intentionally in relationship to convert them to whatever your political position is, or uh, you know, and, and and but but when those occasions and opportunities arise, to seize on them um, and to be open to where that goes. Also, but to encourage our churches and congregations and communities of faith to figure out how can we be bridge communities, um, you know, and sometimes it's easier to get our church or our club or our association, a group, say, let's let's find a, another group that shares some similarities, but it's different. <laughs> um, and um, I mean, to really be in become intentional about that, we have to become intentional about that, whereas generations before us didn't necessarily have to become intentional about it in, in the same way. The other thing that I'm aware of, um, and, and, and I think we're better at this, um, I, I think we're better at this, where and when negativity arises um, for those of us who may not be directly affected to support those who are. Um, I was particularly moved um, in, in Coryville, Texas, at the synagogue there, that the outpouring, um, that the rabbi and other folk there talked about what, how much it meant to have the support of Christians and Muslims um, in that area of Texas, um, as well as other people around the country, just supporting. I think whenever, you know, Dr. King said, darkness cannot cast out darkness, only light can do that. And hatred cannot cast out hatred, only love can do that. That when darkness arises, we cannot ignore the darkness and pretend that it's not there. We must shine light. We must shine light. Um, um, and, and so I think where and when um, bigotry and negativity arises, and it's arising a lot. I mean, hate groups are proliferating. I mean, the FBI I mean, has been talking about this for a couple of years now. Um, anti-Semitism and just a whole host of every nightmare you can think of, they're popping up now. Not just in the U.S., I have to say. There's something global going on. I don't know what that's about, but there's something global. But we must shine light where darkness seems to be prevailing and refuse to, to give in to the darkness by becoming more darkness, but by casting more light um, into it. And one way we do that is to stand with those who are being put down and afflicted. 
whoever they are, whether they are LGBTQ folk, whether they are Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders, whether they are Muslims, whether they are Sikhs, um, whoever, whether they are Christian, I don't know who they are, whoever, for us to stand with them. And when I, it, it makes all the difference in the world, and I think that's something we have to do. We can't, um, we can't look the other way and wish it away. Because it won't go away. But we won't make it go away by adding more darkness, as Dr. King said, to a night that's already devoid of stars. We got to shine light. <laughs> Uh, okay, so maybe th th some of these questions are going to follow a similar pattern, but again, this is actually, I guess I would call it a, I think everyone will relate to this, it's a symptom of this division that we sense in our culture today, and someone is saying, uh, what advice do you have on how to reach a loved one who has embraced, um, I'm going to just broaden it to beliefs that are different than mine, and repeatedly attacks family members to push those beliefs with vehement anger and bitter criticism, to the point that no one wants to have any contact. And this person writes, setting boundaries on unacceptable behavior has not worked and love and kindness, love and kindness does not work. She refuses to listen to anyone. Um, so we fear she's so angry that she has lost her faith and it will just get worse. We are all praying for her and for ourselves. How do we deal with this? Sorry for the hard questions. Well, I mean, the reality is they're, they're, to be there if and when she ever opens the door. Even Motel 6 keeps the light off. You know? And, and it may be that to not return animosity for animosity, and yet to set clear boundaries as best you can, um, um, that may be the best you can do and to, and to, really, um, and to really pray and, and for her. Um, you may not tell her that you're praying for her because <laughs> that just adds fuel to the fire, but to, to, to really pray for her um, and hope and pray that somehow, some way, some day, God can make a way, and maybe a door will crack open, an opportunity will crack open, and maybe it won't. Um, you know, it's kind of like that. Um, now, this, this probably isn't the right thing to say, but that story where the disciples tried and tried to cast out a demon and couldn't, and Jesus said to them, "This kind can only be cast out by prayer." which was a way, it, my reading of that is that's Jesus kind of saying, you know, there's some things you can't change. Some things you're just not going to have, all the power you can muster may not change. You got to take, like my grandma used to sing that song, take it to the Lord and leave it there. And that may be the best you can do. And if a door ever cracks open or, you know, open it. Um. I'm going, to, I'm going to continue this theme for one more question, and then we're going to go in a different path after that. But I feel like this is a fair one to ask, and it's, again, related to this question of how do we practically put into practice what you're talking about, the way of love, particularly when it comes to politics, this person says. So how do we follow the way of love when it comes to politics? Well, I do think, I mean, I do think clarity of values is important. I mean, I mean, I do think that. And finding where there are shared values, um, as well as the higher level ideals, um, that, that politics, if it is only about self-interest, then that's warfare. Um, but, if, but if it's about values that help to better our human condition, um, like that old song says, if I can help somebody along the way, then my living should not be in vain. That that if that is the kind of value that drives me, politics that is about how do we create, um, how do we create and nurture um, in our law enforcement people? I've said this to 
um, well, police officers. I said, we need y'all to be good Samaritans. That's what y'all are. That's what y'all are. We need good Samaritan cops. That, that's what we need. How do we help you become that? And how do we nurture that? You said, how, how do we, wh- where is there a value in something that I happen to stand for and believe in? Very often there may be values that you and I may share about a particular matter where we may be on two different sides of the same issue. Um, I mean, this was some years ago now, and I, I, I remember, I've forgotten when this was. This would have been when Bono, <laughs> how he did this, only Bono could pull this off. But remember when Bono got Jesse Jackson and Jesse Helms uh, to agree on um, age relief in Africa? He found some common values that they both shared. Clearly, they had differences about a whole bunch of other stuff. No question about that. But there was some, and on that common, the common values, they found common ground. And that's more true than it's not true, actually. Um, But we get the fussing and fighting and don't see that. And so one of the things I've learned is to find where are those points of commonality that are usually in values or principles that we believe will help more the most people that will that will actually help um that doesn't always work i know that but it works more often than not um some of the great you know we forget that some of the greatest pieces of legislation whether it was the voting rights act of 1965 which was a compromise <laughs> it it was a compromise folk I, you know lbj was a genius well he knew how to Pigeon old folk too, but it was it. They found the common ground by finding common values, and then they realized, wait a minute, we're close to something here. How can we keep working at it till we actually get something we cannot just all live with, but that we can all be proud of? <laughs> um, that, that's how you do it. You got to work to get there. I mean, it's not just doesn't fall down from heaven or doesn't you know? It's not the Oracle of Delphi that doesn't tell you what it is. You got to work at it to get to it. But it's there if you work if everybody's working at that from that premise, and it really does make a difference. So political engagement, it seems to me, must be value engagement with genuine humility. In the in, I'm in the book, I talked about a time when um, when I was bishop of North Carolina around questions of human sexuality and um, that one of the things that I learned that I had heard when I had training in nonviolence years before, but I learned it, was the importance of being able to both stand with integrity and kneel in humility at the same time. That, that, That I shouldn't pretend that I don't believe something. That's a lie. But but I'm not God, so that doesn't make guarantee that I'm right. <laughs> Only God is God. But I must also kneel before you as my brother or my sister in real humility before the image of God in you. And there be, may be something you have to teach me, maybe something I had to teach you, and out of the little dance we do, um, maybe we'll all find ourselves in a better place. But I cannot arrogate to myself the righteousness to stand up in arrogance, even if I believe what I believe. And that, it's not easy to do, but boy, it makes all the difference in the world. Good. Thank you for that. I, I'm going to have a few more questions here. So we're going to, it, as is always the case here, we're going to go probably for another five or 10 minutes, which I hope is okay with That's everyone. Fine. Um, here's a question from someone in our, I was going to say studio audience, but, uh, in our live, <laughs> our live audience, uh, what are you most interested in, in transforming in the church? I presume that the question has to do with your role as bishop at, to the degree you have the capacity to help transform things in the church. Is that, am I getting at that right? Whoever asked this? Okay. So what are you most interested in, in trans- transformation in the church? Well, I, I um, and, and I'm more and more convinced that the trajectory of the church 
and I can see it in my own life, consistently goes wrong or goes off kilter the further we stray from the actual teachings and the spirit of Jesus of Nazareth. That, that the risen Lord, the reality of the risen Lord is not detached from the Sermon on the Mount. You, you see what I'm saying? It, 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 it is not the, the one who said, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. That's the one who rose from the death imposed by his enemies. You, you see, anyway, I, and so I have, um, I mean, Episcopalians jokingly know that I have, uh, certainly in the early days of my time as presiding bishop, I used to say, we need to become a Jesus movement again. Um, we're the Episcopal branch of the Jesus movement. We're not the only Jesus movement. We need to be the Episcopal branch of the Jesus movement and not just the Episcopal church. I love the Episcopal church. But ain't nobody dying for the Episcopal Church. Why would somebody die for the Episcopal Church? That doesn't make any sense in the world. No, no, no. But you could give your life for Jesus. You see it again? And see, that that's what, and, and, and that Jesus, <coughs> that Jesus and his teachings, his spirit, his actual life, his resurrected life, his real life, the real Jesus, um, who, who comes through the pages of those Gospels, he, that is the key, it seems to me, to the church finding its soul again. Um, and it's the antidote to the church losing it. Um, and so I just, what would happen if we become, as Bonhoeffer said, what would happen when Christ is at the center of our lives for real? We would be a different people, a different church, a Jesus movement, the body of Christ, the people of God, God's own people. And we would make a difference. There, there's that, that passage in Acts, uh, I can't remember what chapter it is, where it says these people uh, who have been turning the world upside down have come here also. They are going around saying there is another king beside the emperor, saying that there is a king named Jesus. When Jesus becomes king, when Christ is at the center, when his way of love is our way of life, we find our lives. And, I, you know, when I retire as presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, if I've left nothing else, I hope I started a revival. A quiet Episcopalian one, no, 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 a revival. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually conclude, and that, that would have been a great final question, actually, but I'm going to give you one final question. Uh -huh. um, and, I'm, uh, by the way, to the, everyone who sent us questions, uh, we had... Too many to be able to get to all of them, so I apologize for that. That is also not unusual. Um, and after this question, I'll have a final thank you for you, Bishop. Uh, sure. But this is, um, I guess, maybe a little bit of a softball, but that seems appropriate. Uh, thank you for your message of faith and love. What role does the cross of Christ and his resurrection play in your view of faith and hope? Oh. When um, this was uh, early 80s, I think I was serving um, <clears throat> at a church in outside of Cincinnati. And uh, a group of us went to hear uh, Desmond Tutu at, at, um, at um, Ohio, OU in Columbus. And um, this would have been, I'm guessing, 84, 85. I don't remember if he had won the Nobel Prize yet or not. I've forgotten now. But um, it was it was pretty much the darkest days of, of the anti-apartheid struggle. Uh, Mandela was still in, pri in prison and there was no prospect of him coming out. Um, the, 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 the struggle over divestment or constructive engagement, all those debates were, were raging. 
um, in the church as well as um, in political world. Um, the, there were police killings um, and funerals became prophetic as well as pastoral moments and statements. Um, and it, it was really dark. It was bleak. Um, anyway, I don't remember Tutu's speech. I don't remember the whole speech. But what I do remember was he, he ended it saying something like, this is based on my memory. Um, he said, I believe that one day my beloved South Africa will be free. That she will be free for all of her children. Black, brown, colored, white, Asian. I believe that my beloved South Africa will one day be free. And I say that because I believe that God has a dream for South Africa. And ultimately nothing can stop God's dream. And I say that because... I believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. The powers of this world, of an empire called Rome, sought to end that dream. But on the third day, he rose again. I believe it. I, I, I believe it. There are moments when I sure doubt it, <laughs> of course, <laughs> but I believe it. And I believe that in the end, love is going to win. And the right is going to prevail. And tyranny and evil will have its day. But it will not have the sway. Because the God who made this world has not forgotten it. And there will be a new heaven and a new earth. God help me, I believe it. And all God's people say amen to that. Um, So just a few thank yous again. I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, Those of you who are joining us virtually, we're so grateful for your presence. Uh, We look forward to seeing you hopefully in March. Those of you who came out on a cold night to sit in our pews, I'm grateful for your presence. Um, And of course, Bishop Curry, it is such a delight to spend some time with you. Thank you for your powerful words. And uh, I just got a person who (laughs) said they'd been writing and rewriting their question a thousand or a hundred times and said, it's such a thought-provoking conversation, which I agree. And she said, can you simply let the good bishop know that Duke Ellington is also one of my favorite theologians and thank him for his inspiring words. (laughs) That's wonderful. uh, We do thank you for being with us. We really look forward to seeing you um, in May of 2023 again. Um, And uh, as a a small token of our gratitude, we've got a little granite plaque for you. I will get this into mail, into the mail, so that you can hopefully display it proudly next to the Buffalo Bills helmet behind you there. Uh, and, oh, uh, there we go. That's, <laughs> no matter the towing cost. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So again, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you again to everyone who has been with us tonight. And uh, God bless you all, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye now. Thank you. God bless. All right. Thank you, Bishop. Appreciate it. All righty.